Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, ovulation induction. Um, polycystic ovary syndrome is the most common uh, anovulatory cause of infertility. And everybody is aware of the, the key features of this uh, condition and the, and the appearance of the ovaries uh, related to anovulation. Um, for about 60 years now, the, the mainstay or the primary um, uh, treatment for uh, ovulation induction in PCOS patients was clomiphene citrate. Uh, this was developed uh, in the uh, 60s. And um, at that time, it was the only choice for ovulation induction. Um, it was orally active, uh, relatively inexpensive, and had relatively few side effects. And even when uh, gonadotropins were uh, introduced, clomiphene citrate still had a lot of benefits and, and fewer risks in terms of multiple pregnancy. So I think the widespread adoption of clomiphene citrate for ovulation induction was definitely warranted uh, for all those uh, decades. However, there are some uh, problems with clomiphene citrate related to its mechanism of action. So it uh, is um, a selective estrogen receptor modulator. It's a combination of two uh, isomers. And the one that uh, predominantly is effective in treatment is uh, a, an estrogen receptor antagonist isomer, which depletes estrogen receptors in the hypothalamus and the pituitary. And that uh, takes away essentially estrogen negative feedback on the brain, so FSH levels uh, are increased and follicle development uh, begins. Now, one of the problems uh, with this uh, mechanism of action is that the estrogen receptor depletion is not specific for the brain, it's actually generalized. So we see the same estrogen depletion occasionally happening in the endometrium or in the cervix. Uh, and as a result, uh, sometimes the, the endometrium doesn't respond adequately to estrogen stimulation because the estrogen receptors are depleted. And as uh, Professor um, Dracopoulos uh, mentioned, uh, we used to see many cases of unexplained infertility treated for up to a year uh, with uh, clomiphene citrate for uh, augmenting ovulation. Uh, by general uh, practitioners or uh, general OBGYNs before they were referred for infertility treatment. And we'd often see patients with this sort of a picture uh, who'd been on 12 cycles of clomiphene citrate, which essentially meant they were being, being given a contraceptive for, for the whole uh, year they were trying to get pregnant. And this was one of the findings, well, this specific finding was the impetus for us to develop an alternative to clomiphene citrate. And that's when we came up with the idea for uh, an aromatase inhibitor. So one more thing about uh, clomiphene, the, the um, isomers have quite a long half-life, up to two weeks. So there's depletion of estrogen receptors, takes away negative feedback of estrogen, FSH levels go up. FSH will stimulate follicle development, and the follicles will make estrogen, but the receptors remain depleted, so the brain doesn't recognize this elevated uh, estradiol, and FSH levels remain elevated. So there is an increased risk of multiple ovulation with clomiphene citrate because of the prolonged elevation of FSH. So just to summarize the problems with clomiphene citrate, uh, there are peripheral antiestrogenic effects that include a thin endometrium and unfavorable cervical mucus. Uh, there are uh, studies showing reduced uterine blood flow. Uh, all of these effects result in a lower pregnancy rate than you'd expect from the high uh, success in terms of ovulation. And the long uh, tissue half-life of the isomers of clomiphene results in a high multiple pregnancy rate. So we uh, thought about using aromatase inhibitors when they uh, were first developed for uh, breast cancer treatment. Uh, these are um, um, drugs that uh, prevent uh, the conversion of androgens to estrogen in the body. Um, letrozole and anastrozole are specific non-steroidal uh, reversible inhibitors. Uh, they have a short half-life uh, in comparison to clomiphene, so their half-life is around 
two days instead of two weeks. And they have no direct estrogenic or anti-estrogenic effects. So the way uh, aromatase inhibitors work is they actually, uh, instead of fooling the brain into thinking there's no estrogen, they actually inhibit the conversion of androgen to estrogen. So estrogen levels are low. Um, the receptors in the brain are intact, but because estrogen is low, that takes away negative feedback. So FSH goes up. It will stimulate uh, follicle development. And now when you stop the aromatase inhibitor, it wears off very quickly. Estrogen production from the follicles increases. And because the receptors are intact, they can recognize that estrogen is going up. So it shuts down FSH like it would in a normal uh, spontaneous menstrual cycle. So usually we only get one follicle uh, ovulating. So the aromatase inhibitors for ovulation induction have uh, a central mechanism of action because they uh, reduce uh, estrogen and take away negative feedback in the brain. They also have uh, what turns out to be a peripheral uh, direct mechanism in the ovary to increase androgen levels, which increases FSH responsiveness uh, by increasing FSH receptor gene expression. Uh, they don't have any uh, adverse effects on estrogen receptors. They have a short half-life and there is an intact central feedback loop for estrogen feedback on FSH. And that results in a predominantly mono uh, follicular uh, ovulation when you use let letrozole uh, by itself. Uh, there were some uh, dose response studies showing that uh, five milligrams of letrozole daily for five days uh, gave a slightly higher pregnancy rate than 2.5 milligrams per day. But we also looked at uh, the idea of, of using just a single dose of an aromatase inhibitor uh, based on calculating the disappearance half-life. So, so if you give a, a one tablet a day, the letrozole will build up a bit in the circulation because it has a half-life of 45 hours. And then when you stop it, it disappears uh, in a pretty predictable uh, fashion. So we tried 10 milligrams, 20 milligrams, and 30 milligrams uh, doses of letrozole in a single dose on day three. And as you can see, this 30 milligram dose pretty much disappears at the same rate as the 2.5 milligram dose, but we thought using 20 milligrams, the area under the curve here is, is, is still good, is probably better than the single uh, dose. And the letrozole actually wears off more quickly, which was an issue related to safety, uh, especially after the paper of, or the abstract of Bill Jan came out uh, uh, in 2005. So, so we did a study comparing a 20 milligram single dose, so that's eight tablets of clomiphene taken all at once on day three of the cycle, compared with uh, one tablet a day for five days, this is the usual uh, regimen. So here's the single dose versus the five day regimen. Uh, and you can see that essentially there was no difference uh, between the two in terms of uh, any of the, uh, parameters of the cycle, nor in the uh, clinical pregnancy rate per cycle uh, in patients with polycystic ovary syndrome who were uh, having uh, ovulation induction. And we also added the single dose uh, versus the multiple dose to uh, FSH, and again found uh, no difference in uh, clinical pregnancy rate or uh, follicle uh, outcome. So we, we believe that this is a viable option uh, to just use one single dose of eight tablets on day three. Uh, it saves the patient having to remember to take a pill every day. And since the side effects of letrozole are idiosyncratic, they're not really dose related. Um, the side effects really are the same, whether you give a large single dose or uh, multiple doses. Um, so there were some studies uh, following our initial um, uh, case series, uh, some proper randomized controlled studies comparing clomiphene citrate with aromatase inhibitors for um, ovulation induction. For ovulation induction um, in uh, polycystic ovary syndrome. And the, the major paper 
major paper came from uh, Legro and his uh, group from the uh, Reproductive Medicine Network. This was, I think, the first uh, definitive uh, manuscript published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2014. And they looked at 750 infertile women with PCOS who were randomized to get uh, clomiphene citrate or letrozole. And what they found was that the live birth rate for the entire group was significantly higher with letrozole compared to clomiphene. Um, and this difference was specifically or, or uh, markedly different in patients who had a BMI greater than 30. And here's the BMI greater than 39. So you can see that there's quite a, a separation between the clomiphene and letrozole in these two groups. There was a lower uh, but still significant um, uh, difference in the uh, patients who had a BMI less than 30. So the conclusion of this study was that letrozole should be considered as a first-line treatment for anovulatory infertility in PCOS. And this uh, study was followed by uh, this uh, Cochrane uh, review in 2018, looking at nine different uh, randomized studies, and they again found uh, significantly improved uh, pregnancy rate with letrozole versus uh, clomiphene. So to summarize uh, this part of the talk, letrozole seems to be more effective than clomiphene citrate for ovulation induction in PCOS. I didn't actually show you that data. Uh, there's a higher pregnancy and live birth rate uh, compared to clomiphene. And letrozole may also be effective for clomiphene, clomiphene citrate uh, failures. Uh, there's a low risk of multiple pregnancy when you use letrozole alone. Uh, in our hands, it's about 4%. And it has a short half-life with no anti-estrogenic or estrogenic effects. Uh, so we always, pretty much always see a good endometrial uh, lining in patients uh, treated with letrozole. So the question that remains is, uh, are aromatase in inhibitors safe for ovulation induction? And again, the, the, the seed was planted in 2005 by an abstract at the uh, American Society of Reproductive Medicine that suggested there might be more birth defects with uh, uh, letrozole compared to uh, natural conceptions. Um, so we've, Followed that up, uh, my colleague uh, and friend, Dr. Tulandi from McGill, uh, organized a multi-center Canadian study looking at five uh, clinics in Canada who had experience using both letrozole and clomiphene citrate. And we followed the outcome of uh, 911 pregnancies. Uh, 514 babies were born following letrozole or letrozole plus FSH and 397 babies were born following clomiphene citrate or clomiphene citrate plus FSH. And we looked at congenital anomalies in these two groups. So what we found was that the overall malformation rate was double in the clomiphene group compared to the letrozole group, but this was not uh, significant. We didn't have enough uh, cases. Uh, major malformation rate was 3% in the clomiphene group and 1.2% in the letrozole group. Again, this was not significant. But when we look specifically at cardiac anomalies, uh, which occur about one in, in every 400 pregnancies in the general population, we found that there was only one cardiac anomaly out of 514 births in the letrozole group, uh, but seven uh, out of about 400 uh, pregnancies in the clomiphene group uh, which was uh, significantly different. So in conclusion, letrozole for ovulation induction doesn't seem to be in, uh, associated with an increased risk of birth defects when compared, compared to clomiphene citrate. And in the, on the contrary, uh, we found that clomiphene may be associated with an increased risk of cardiac anomalies. And this sort of fits with that two-week half-life because for a drug to be cleared completely from the body, it usually takes five half-lives. So that would be um, uh, 10 weeks in the case of clomiphene citrate. So it means that there may still be some clomiphene citrate around when the baby's organs are uh, forming. Uh, finally, I wanna show you this meta-analysis that was presented at the American Society of Reproductive Medicine meeting last year. Uh, they looked at 4,613 babies from 44 studies with the use of letrozole. 
2% uh, of the babies were born with congenital anomalies, and 0.5% uh, of the babies had major congenital anomalies, and this was not different from natural conceptions. So uh, in conclusion, uh, we now believe that aromatase inhibitors should be a first-line treatment for ovulation induction in patients with PCOS. The efficacy for ovulation induction is similar to clomiphene. Uh, letrozole may be efficacious in clomiphene citrate failures. Uh, we don't see any adverse estrogen receptor uh, effects, so we don't see thin lining or poor cervical mucus with uh, letrozole, which may explain a slightly improved pregnancy rate. Um, there's a short half-life and no accumulation from cycle to cycle. And there's a very low multiple pregnancy rate in patients with polycystic ovary syndrome, usually around four or five percent. Uh, that translates then into a reduced need for monitoring, which I think is important if you have general OBGYNs or general practitioners doing ovulation induction uh, without easy access to ultrasound uh, monitoring. Um, and uh, the newer data indicates that aromatase inhibitors are safe with no adverse fetal effects when used for ovulation, assuming that a pregnancy test is negative before the letrozole is started uh, in, an, uh, in a patient who's amenorrhea. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for uh, your attention and 